became the first black American to participate in a major U.S. tennis tournament. In that same year, the Cold War turned hot. On June 25, 1950, troops from communist North Korea poured across the border at the 38th parallel and attacked the non-communist South. Five short years after the end of World War II, America led United Nations forces against the army of North Korean dictator Kim Il-sung. For most of the world, the war was the first test of the new United Nations. To Americans, the Korean War was about one thing, containing communism. One of the first reporters at the battlefront was a young correspondent for Time magazine, Frank Gibney. We stayed with one of our friends, an army colonel, who woke us in the middle of the night and said, they've broken through, head south. We got uh, ferried across the Han River with the help of some Korean soldiers. And as we're going further south, then we suddenly saw a couple of American jets flying over. And I turned to my friends, I said, good God, this is World War III, it started. You know how to fire a carbine, sir? Just release the safety there and squeeze the trigger. It fires automatic till you stop firing. I'm a lawyer from Denver, Colorado, Mike. I probably can't hit a thing. Judas, how'd you ever get out here in a smelly ditch in Korea? It's just what I've been asking myself. It was a question that many young Americans would ask themselves. Early confidence in America's might evaporated in the face of the North Korean onslaught. We were told that it was a light mop-up and we got ambushed. We were driving down this road. We went over a little rice paddy bridge and they let a few trucks go over the rice paddy bridge and before you know it, all hell broke loose. The bridge was blowing up and the trucks where we were lined up and couldn't back out, so everybody just bailed out of the trucks, and there was machine gun fire, mortar fire. It was really hell, you know. I got hit by gunfire, and I was laying in the ground. Later, I got hit by mortar fire, and shrapnel severed my spine. My dear old mother's heads are hanging low. Got our orders to Korea, we must go. So mothers don't be sad. Out of condition and outnumbered, American troops deployed from peacetime duty in nearby Japan were ill-prepared to stave off the communist advance. We hoped and prayed this day would never come. It was a grim time. We got newsreels and they were grim shots of... American boys on some little hills with names that no one could understand near places that no one ever heard of. I mean, no one had ever heard of Seoul. On the American home front, the swift reversal of fortunes in Korea aroused fears that for the first time in history, Americans might lose a war. Worse yet, they might lose a war to the communists. We're all being pushed on this issue of communists versus us. Are the communists 10 feet tall? Do they have some magic stuff that we don't have? Are they the wave of the future? Or has the West, I mean, and there are all kinds of writers who are writing, you know, has the West become decadent? And there was this covert fear that the very quality of our affluence, of our material excellence, would make us soft. I'll give you odds. Kane's dead five minutes after Frank gets off the train. With the American dream on the line, Hollywood gave people what they craved. A righteous hero who inhabited a world where good and evil were as simple as black and white. The golden age of the Western, the American Western, was in those Cold War 1950s. Uh, high Noon, uh, the good guy Gary Cooper, unsupported by the townspeople who all hid under their beds and he had to, as the Nietzschean superhero, go out and face the bad guys. And if not for him, uh, the town would be taken over, the country would be dead, America is gone. Our homes, our 
our nation. All the things we believe in are in great danger. This danger has been created by the rulers of the Soviet Union. Accused of being soft on communism, President Harry Truman was determined to hold the line in Korea. To do this, he needed a real-life hero. The victor of the war in the Pacific, General Douglas MacArthur, saw his wars in classical terms. He believed in fighting the enemy until they were utterly destroyed. For him, there was no substitute for victory. MacArthur sought victory by attempting the impossible, landing behind enemy lines at the seaport of Incheon. It was to be the greatest triumph of his long career. He took a town that everyone said could not be taken and did it with very few dead or wounded. Following the general's battle plan, his troops swept inland, retaking the capital city of Seoul. On September 29, 1950, MacArthur arrived to restore the city to South Korean leader Syngman Rhee. MacArthur's orders were to destroy the retreating North Korean army. How far to pursue the enemy was left up to the general to decide. He was the general. He was the man who knew. His was the master hand. He could do anything. And, of course, he had this long background, which no one else could match. He'd been on the scene as a general for about 30 years. And he knew Asians to this extent. He did have a respect for them. And uh, he had this, this grandiloquent view of America. I mean, MacArthur would have been a perfect chief of staff for Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Operation Killer in Korea grinds steadily forward and northward, where United Nations forces face a new adversary, MUD. The problem of bringing their superior firepower to bear is a back-breaking job for the Allies. But As UN forces pushed north, North Korea's Chinese allies sent a message to Washington. If American troops crossed the 38th parallel, the Chinese would enter the war. Dubbed the Sorcerer of Incheon, Douglas MacArthur treated the Chinese threat with contempt. If the Chinese did intervene, he said, he would deal them such a blow that it would rock Asia and turn back communism everywhere. At home, Harry Truman was alarmed. Joe McCarthy's attacks on John Service and other China experts in the State Department had deprived the White House of an accurate assessment of the Chinese threat. But Truman knew one thing. He did not want a war with China. Come in! Well, 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 look who's here! I haven't seen you in many a year. If I, I knew you were coming, I'd have baked a cake. Truman summoned his general to Wake Island in the Pacific. He was afraid that MacArthur might provoke the Chinese and start World War III. He was not even sure whether MacArthur would come out to meet the plane of the President of the United States, but he did, and uh, Truman was offended by the sort of MacArthur's, you know, hat, that scrambled eggs and the old, you know, the, the, the signature uh, field cap he had and the shirt, and Truman said, if I had a man like that in my outfit, I'd have busted him so quickly he wouldn't have known what happened. So you have a natural tension, uh, one, a tough, modest, feisty guy who knows whatever else, my president. And then the other, this man of enormous ego and grandiosity who's thinking, I'm the senior figure, I'm the senior American political and military figure in the world. Why is that little haberdasher in charge of me? So you have these tensions. MacArthur assured.